Bible. Yeah, the first thing, before, maybe before that, is that the, remember you told us that the first fellow who asked you, asked you to join was a man of management who wanted oh. you to tell about it. So oh, when yeah. you're ready, Jamie, we'll... We're wrong. Okay. Steve. Yes, okay. Well, again, go back, to go back uh, uh, at the first, uh, uh, the first I heard of the organizing was the, what we call a second hand, is marginal management. I'm sorry, I want you to start again and name the mill. I worked to sell the manufacturing. Okay, but you see, the audience hasn't heard Oh, that, yes. But, okay, so, okay, now. Yeah, well, at the mill, at the Selma Manufacturing Company, uh, I learned later that uh, the people was a little bit leery about letting me know about it because they didn't know me, and I lived in a different part of town. But one night, uh, or afternoon, but that time we'd gone on eight hours a day. The NRA pass was working two to ten in the afternoon or night. And the second hand, I was working at Selma Manufacturing Company, and the second hand came down and he said, you know, I hear they're organizing a union and they're going to have a meeting Saturday morning over in East Birmingham at the Masonic Hall. He said, I'd like for you to go and see who's there and come back and tell me. Well, it was <coughs> first I'd heard about the union and I'd perked my ears up because I was raised to believe in the union and nobody wouldn't have to ask me to uh, join. I'd hunt up the first person. So he was telling me news, not knowing that. So I went to the meeting, and and uh, of course I didn't come back and tell him nothing. And uh, but I signed the union card. After I got off one night at ten o'clock, the had the union cards out by uh, in a vacant lot by the mill, and there's an old stump, and there's a lantern. The guys had set a lantern on that truck. I signed my union card. And we had to pay a dollar to join and 25 cents a week dues when we joined because back then the union didn't have them. Each local had to carry their own weight. We had to raise our own money and carry our own, own organizing because the union didn't have the money to furnish paid organizing. And uh, from the very beginning, we paid initiation fee, which we kept... Uh, could keep 50 cents in our treasury and send 50 cents to the International Union. We pay 25 cents a week dues. Okay, now tell us about the uh, what the meetings were like. Well, we had meetings every Saturday morning because that, working uh, three shifts, that's the only time that all the people could be together. And we had good meetings, very good meetings, and lively discussions. Because I think uh, at that time... Uh, most of the people uh, had a taste of a little better conditions during the Labor Act, and they had so much confidence in our, our government that they would back us and enforce the laws that we wouldn't be discriminated against. In the old days, uh, about the only way you could get a union, if somebody started organizing a union and one person got fired, they pretty much had a, a pack of they'd all quit and go out on strike. Sometimes they won and sometimes they didn't. But I think that because of the fact that uh, the, the whole political climate had changed, give people encouragement that they weren't as uh, afraid of losing their job. And if they did lose their job, they felt that they had the law that would be enforced. And uh, they were out more open. And the, after we got a, enough sign that we felt safe in the majority, we could, became more open. But we still, to get in the in the uh, union hall at the meeting, you had to have we had a doorkeeper, and you had to have the password, and we changed this password every three months, and if you didn't get your password, if you didn't have your dues paid, because you had to have money to pay hall rent, and uh, that was sometime we'd get we get I I was elected treasurer of the local. And I'd have to stay and go out and collect my quarters every payday. Uh, to get, I had we wore big aprons to put our waste in, and uh, that's what I kept my my dues, my, my quarters in for my dues paying. For a while, our local got down because we we had to have a certain amount of members, paid members, to hold our charter. And at one time, we got so low that. I had to put in some extra money to, to 
to uh, keep our charter. And so uh, I had to, I had a hard time myself, but I enlisted some of the people to help me collect dues so that uh, we could hold our charter. Because people just, the work so cheap we couldn't have it hardly. The uh, quarter was a quarter back then. Okay, I want you to go back and uh, tell me what the meetings were like. Well, they were mainly organizing meetings. Just, just say the meetings were mainly Yeah, uh, the meetings that we'd have on Saturday morning, we usually have a speaker. Uh, we'd usually have someone from another union. I remember very well, we had a young man who worked at the USP State Pipe Shop, and they were trying, they were, their plant was near our mill, and they were trying to organize at the same time. His name was Cecil Kerr. And he used to come a lot and speak to us and encourage us. And I think it encouraged him too, because they were trying to organize. And uh, somebody from the uh, other unions, uh, the uh, Central Labor Union here, the speaker, William O'Hare, would come a time or two. He was secretary of the uh, state council. But since the union had didn't have but a couple of paid organizers. They had, everybody was meeting on Saturday morning and it took them, if they met with us once every six months, they were lucky to have, we was lucky to get a union representative from the textile union there. But Ike Robinson, who uh, really started our union in Birmingham, he was a general organizer for the uh, AFL. And uh, he uh, really started the union uh, in Birmingham among us as well as other workers, other other shops he was trying to organize. And Ike was very, very good speaker and uh, he, he tended our meetings as often as he could. Did you have, did you have music? Did you have prayer? Oh, did you have what? Oh, yeah. I, I don't remember. I don't think we opened, I can't remember when opening meetings with prayer started. I don't think, we always, we sang. And not necessarily union songs, but uh, I know that uh, we sung a lot of old Woody Guthrie songs. Because everybody knew that and this land is my land, and this land is your land. It was very popular back then. Of course, I got acquainted uh, with Solidarity Forever, and that was my favorite song, and okay. it is today. Okay, let's start over again. Now I'm going to tell you, Woody Guthrie didn't write that "This Land Is Your Land" until 1941. But he sang it. No? Well, that did. No. Oh, no, that's right. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah. well we that's did so, sing that song. Okay, let's I start, start my, over and talk time about, talk about That's right, because it... Yeah, start back and think. start again saying that we used to sing, and I learned Solidarity Forever. Yeah. It's been my favorite song ever since, and maybe yeah. you could even start to sing it. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, well, we sang, we always opened our meetings with song. We uh, textile workers and the clothing workers has always been a singing union. And even even in the mills we used to sing because we'd sing we couldn't nobody couldn't hear us but we'd sing uh, I sang constantly when I was working uh, mainly the popular songs of the day uh, let me call you sweetheart and I'll be loving you all all the popular songs that made in the twenties uh, I didn't know anything about country music at that time they come later but we always opened our songs. Uh, with a union song. Somebody have a union song book. And uh, Solidarity Forever uh, was kind of easy to sing and was a favorite. We sang the chorus, the, the words, the, the verses. A lot of them couldn't sing, but when you hit the chorus, they could all sing that. And uh, it's, I still think it's one of the most, uh, the best union song that was ever written. How did it go? Because, uh, well, uh, it's uh, when the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run. There can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. Now, during the strike of 34, 
we change that chorus to say, Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, we'll stick until we win. Another song that, that uh, I don't know if it's then or not, but later, that we shall not be moved. I got the feeling about it like one of the young fellow on the picket line said to me one day, Euler, I have heard that song till I can't stand it. And he said, I'll pick it as long as they don't start singing that song. When they start singing that song, I'm leaving. I've had it with that song. <laughs> and it was easy to sing, and it was constantly sang on the picket line. We shall not be, we shall not be moved. We shall not be, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Now you make up your own verses. Let's see. We're fighting for our union, we shall not be moved. We're fighting for our union, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, we shall not be moved. And anybody just start off with a verse and there's anything that come in their mind and they just start singing it. And it was easy to sing, and it was, I guess, one of the most sung union songs on the picket line. Okay, now we want to move on to, and I'm going to take those pictures away from you because they're, they're reflecting on your face. Uh, uh, we want you to go on now to uh, when the strike started. Well, we presented the contract to our, uh, the summer manufacturing company. And uh, they use it as an excuse. I don't know if they really uh, thought they'd break the union by closing down and scaring us. But anyhow, they closed down saying that they couldn't operate a un uh, under those conditions of that contract. So they shut down. And we were out before the... Uh, now, I'm going to start, you, start over again because I want you to say the, the time, the, the month, and I the date. I can't remember. I'm going to give it to you because we got it out of this study. I don't know why I can't remember it. I hear it all the time. The latter part of May. Okay, go get that. The strike started in Alabama and the 12th of September and middle of September, I mean, middle of, of July until through the general strike until the mill opened up again when? Oh, no wonder we went back to work after, right after the strike. The strike. Yeah, right, right after the strike was called off. The end of September. The strike was called off. So you were out for... for May, um, June, July, and August. You were uh, Almost four months. Almost four months. So tell us then, you know, all of that, and then tell us how you lived. Uh-huh. Okay? All right. Now, just wait a minute. Are we yeah. ready, Jamie? Yeah, we've been rolling. Okay, rolling. Okay, fine. All right. Uh... We've been organized about a year at Selma Manufacturing Company when we felt that it was time to present the contract to the company. And uh, Steve Nance, who was uh, director then of state uh, from Atlanta, was the uh, director of the union, and he was a leader of the organizing committee and uh, I mean the uh, negotiating committee. And uh, we presented the contract in a meeting. And the company shut down, saying that they couldn't operate and they wouldn't sign the contract because they did, couldn't operate under those conditions. I just wonder if that's the reason or they had some other reason. They thought maybe that they'd shut down, they'd make us forget the union. But anyway, then we were on strike and we were out. And then when the Alabama people came out first, before the general textile strike was called, and the other sh uh, locals in Alabama struck. So we were out there from the latter part of May until in September. Uh, of course, people, uh, back in those days, you didn't have much to eat. I remember, I'll have to go back a little bit, when I first broke the news to the 
my family that was organizing a union and that I had joined. We were sitting at the table and I said, well, we've organized a union, organized a union out at the uh, mill. And I said, uh, I've joined. And my sister said, yeah, you lose your job. I don't know why she felt that way about the union because her husband was a union man, was uh, working under union conditions as a plaster, and I guess she felt like that if I lost my job that she'd have to take care of us, I don't know. But anyhow, Mama spoke up and said, well, what's she going to lose if she loses a job? She said she's not doing anything but eating and sleeping, and she's going to eat and sleep some way. Mama said, I've never seen any skeletons of people laying around where they've starved to death. And uh, that's the way my mother, she was a, my mother had this plenty of old old-fashioned guts. She believed in something, she just believed in it. And back me all the way, my whole family did back me all the way. When I, well, they just left it up to me. I figured I was doing the job, I was doing the work, and I was the one who knew what the conditions were and what I had to do about it. So we were out, we were out all that time. But we'd have teams that go around. Back then, people would it was come out on strike. Uh, they would get help from other locals. Maybe not so much money. We'd take anything they'd give us. Uh, and stores would give us. A lot of the people who traded with grocery stores when they was working ran accounts there. And they would go and they'd give a sack of flour or a bag of beans or a bucket of lard or margarine or whatever, powdered milk. Well, we'd come back to the uh, little old shack that we had there and we'd uh, partially that, we'd have sacks and we'd give it out to the people who needed it. Uh, living with my sister and uh, there was a good friend of mine who uh, was on strike, she uh, moved in with us because she couldn't pay her room rent because she, so she moved in the house and moved out with us and uh, we would hitchhike well, there was always somebody back then that'd come along with a car if you stand on the stride. It, it was very easy to get rides into town. I remember when I used to be standing by the, waiting for the streetcar, if somebody come along in the car, they knew how, what seven cents mean. And you didn't have no quills about riding with them. They were really earnest to, you know, would you like to ride into town? And I got to save a lot of car tickets sometime <laughs> by, I only saved me two cents, but I was glad to save the two cents. So we get, well, sometimes other people, union people, would pick us up and take us and uh, when we didn't have car fare. So Ruth and I, uh, she stayed with us and, and uh, well, she lived, her folks lived in Cordova and they were on strike too in Cordova. And we would, we survived as good as if we'd been working. Because most people, we had no mill village, but most of the people, I guess, the people that's written from, rather have them in the house and to vacate it, so why it would destroy their property. I heard a lot of people say that they'd rather have somebody in the house if they couldn't pay the rent right then than to have it stand vacant because it would deteriorate. That might have been why we weren't, nobody didn't get evicted. Now, during that time, there was a lot of violence, and uh, your, your, uh, the head of the uh, AFL, I mean, the head of the union for Alabama got uh, picked up, yeah. and all of this. Could you talk about that and how that affected you? Well, uh, John, uh, John Dean, who was uh, kind of the leader they, at that time, uh, jo Albert Cox uh, was from Columbus, Georgia. And he was first to come, and then John Dean came down from New York, and he was heading up. And then, then uh, they added Molly Dowd and Alice Berry, who worked in the mill with us. She went on the staff for a while. So there was four people. Well, of course, Huntsville, all the mills in Huntsville, were very, very militant, the Huntsville area was. And a lot of the uh, time had to be spent in there because there were so many people there. And uh, the, a lot of the activity and the, and the uh, publicity was focused on Huntsville.
because of so many people in that one area. In fact, that was a predominant place to work. That was about the only, only, only work there was. So uh, they stayed at the Erskine Ram Ramsey Hotel. Erskine Russell Hotel. It's the Erskine Ramsey here, and I get him mixed up with Erskine Russell. So John was kidnapped, uh, taken out of his room, uh, and taken over the line and to uh, Fayetteville, Tennessee, and uh, let off at the Pope Hotel, where he called the people back and they went up and got him. Now those people up there were like John, and they stuck together, and they furnished him protection from then on. And uh, as I did it all over, they felt that they owed it to the organizers to protect them from uh, the few people who uh, did try to fight the Union in Huntsville. Of course, it was fighting and losing battle because the overwhelming majority of the people in Huntsville depended on the cotton mills for the living, one way or the other. Now, you mentioned the bridge. Oh, the across the Tennessee River. The bridge going across the Tennessee River from Decatur. Decatur, years ago, uh, they had a railroad shop there back in the 20s, and they had a strike, and uh, I'm told by the uh, Railroad Workers Union that the, they really didn't need that since they run in from, they had to stop to have the train serviced in Decatur from Nashville to Birmingham and later on as improvements came they didn't have to stop in Decatur. They, they could run on to Birmingham without getting the cars serviced. So uh, it was more or less uh, not as much of the Union shutting the, the the car works down as the uh, didn't wasn't any need for it anymore that they could but no, run the, you mentioned that there was a, the, a well I'm talking grade. about the background of how Decatur was anti-union yeah. and Decatur uh, started, was anti-union just started Decatur was an anti-union yes and the whole atmosphere in Decatur which was about 30 miles from Huntsville across the river and that was a toll bridge no sorry you have to start off by saying, now Decatur was an anti-union town. Yeah, the sentiment in, in there, and the Goodyear Tire and River. No, no, sorry, you see, the audience won't hear anything until I oh. cut in. Oh. So you want to say, Decatur was an anti-union town. Georgia cut you off before, so we oh. missed that. Decatur was an anti-union town, and uh, this bridge that crossed the Tennessee River there, going to Huntsville and back, there was a toll bridge, and it was, you would get waylaid. There, when you stop to pay toll, they had to watch very carefully. That's where the vigilantes in Decatur uh, would lauder on the bridge in order if you stop to pay your toll, you was fair game if you have the suspicion that you're a union organizer. And of course, they hear about the flying squadrons. Of course, the uh, textile workers who were militant in Huntsville was coming down to hold meetings to try to get those uh, people at the Goodyear Mill they're organized. They made fabric for automobile tires. And again, they held their meetings down on the river. And, uh, but they didn't fare as well in Decatur as they did in Huntsville because you had a hardcore of anti-union people from those at railroad yards closing down. They blamed the union. And everybody you talked to, oh, was your union that closed down like the railroad yard. You could not get it out of their mind. And, uh, Two of the, the hosiery mills that were there, the hosiery mills tried to organize them. They had some full-fashion hosiery mills there. And those people made good money by the standards that was being paid. They were making anywhere from $20, $25 a week. While full-fashion knitters in union shops were making $75 to $100. These people had no way of, uh, of gauging what their job was worth. They had nobody to compare them. And they felt that they were being paid. You couldn't talk to those people. You just might as well... Uh, talk to the stone wall. They just felt that they was doing good. They was doing so much better than everybody else that the union couldn't do anything for them. They don't realize that you have two alternatives in a non-union shop. You work on the boss's conditions or quit. I joined the union mainly for conditions more than I did. I need the money. But the right to, to talk back for myself when I felt like I was right without being in fear of in retaliation. I felt that like my rights as a worker to be able to talk back for myself and my fellow worker. Now, many 
people have told us about the particular helplessness of women in the textile man. Uh, could you talk about that? That went on. Just, just uh, what went the, on? Oh, uh, t t uh, sexual harassment. Of course, we didn't think about it in those terms in those days. More people didn't think about women's rights. And the, most of the women looked to women, men for leadership. But the boss, uh, if he took a notion he wanted to date a girl, he sh either by innuendo or actions or actual threats, uh, they feared for their job if they didn't submit to him. And in fact, in some of the hearings was had in Huntsville, some of the women got on the stands and told how they were uh, threatened by their jobs if they didn't date the bosses. And some of the men and their wives were subjected to the same thing. Uh, it was a shame. And I saw it happen in the mill I worked in. Uh, I know that it happened in the Dwight mill. I remember one night that part of the spinning room was a huge spinning room. In fact, they had two spinning rooms. And the spooling room was in the middle. And for some reason or other, we had two types of yarn in the spinning room. And they didn't need any shut down and cut out the lights. And uh, right there in the mill, uh, the bosses took girls back there during that time. I know that went on. I'm glad I never had to be subjected to it. I wasn't very attractive. <laughs> Some reason I wasn't bothered, and I was glad. I don't know what I would have done. You think they were afraid of you? I uh, know. I don't think so. I don't. Th I was skinny and tall and not very attractive, and and I guess they didn't have no. I didn't have any. Uh, they didn't have no. No. Uh, weren't interested. I think there was a glint in your eye that they were afraid of. <laughs> I had a guy, a good friend of mine, tell me one time uh, that I scared men. And I, uh, I, I said, John, what are you talking about? He said, what do you, what do, you do? You intimidate men. I guess it was because there were very few women that was as outspoken and as, uh, as aggressive as I was. And I never have had much patience with women who, who uh, stand back and say so much of it, it was that the men was keeping them down, that the women weren't trying to get ahead. And I think a lot of that happens today. They don't want to look up to the men. And I never did feel like that I had to look up to a man. I felt like that I had as much sense as anybody else. Okay, that's great.